It's the 11th of July, 2018, and this is API Conversation number 11, Kevin Knuth. This is your host, Paul Carr, and I wanted to speak to Kevin when I saw his article late last month in The Conversation, one that got quite a lot of circulation. The article was entitled, Are We Alone? The Question is Worthy of Serious Scientific Study, and it largely focuses on the question of, do UFOs show that we are not alone? I wanted to know more about Kevin's thoughts on the whole topic, so I emailed him and he very kindly agreed to join me in this conversation. Kevin Knuth is an associate professor in the Department of Physics at the University of Albany. He is editor-in-chief of the journal Entropy. He is a former NASA research scientist, having worked for four years at NASA Ames Research Center in the Intelligent Systems Division. He has 20 years of experience in applying Bayesian and maximum entropy methods to the design of machine learning algorithms for data analysis applied to the physical sciences. His current research interests include the foundations of physics, inference and inquiry, autonomous robotics, and the search for and characterization of extrasolar planets. He has over 100 peer-reviewed publications and has been invited to give over 80 presentations in 13 countries. The reason I wanted to talk to you was because I saw your article in the conversation, as did lots of other people, and... We said, well, here's a legit academic talking about UFOs as if it were a serious topic, which is something we really want to encourage. I'm part of a research group that is, you know, volunteer. We don't, none of us are professional researchers. I'm an engineer during the day. We, we thought that would be great to have someone come out and say openly, someone who's an, who's a, a, an academic with a responsible position has been, has worked, apparently, if I understand correctly, you have, uh, you were with NASA for quite a while as well. Yeah, I was a NASA research scientist for four years. That's why That's why I'm here. That's, and that's why I asked you to, to be on API Conversations. And uh, the first question that came to my mind is, is why? I mean, what what is it about UFOs and the question of we are not alone that interested you? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think I've, I've always been interested in UFOs. I've always, you know, heard about them since I was perhaps a young teenage boy. And always thought that was kind of interesting, and the the idea that if some UFOs were extraterrestrial spacecraft, then then it would be possible to travel between the stars, which I thought was very exciting. So in that sense, I was I'm, I've been enamored with interstellar travel, and and so I found the topic interesting. I I think one of the one of the events that really made me think about it a bit more seriously when I started graduate school. I got my master's degree in physics from Montana State University in Bozeman. And it was our first or second week of graduate school. I just moved out to Montana from Wisconsin. I'd never really been out west before. And there was an event that occurred on a nearby ranch that was on the news where there were um, two cows had been mutilated. And it was very strange, and people were very freaked out about it. There were surgical procedures um, performed on the cows. So if I remember right, the, the eyes were removed, the tongue was removed, the sex organs were removed. It was very strange. And on one of the cows, there was, if I remember right, it was a, there was a cylindrical hole, like, punched out of the cow. It was missing. And I thought, that's really bizarre. And so... Several of us graduate students had gotten together. Some of the new graduate students had gotten together the next day and were discussing this because it was all over the news. And, you know, our, our take on this was, what kind of weird place did we just move to? <laughs> I've hmm. never heard about anything like this happening before. And from the news reports, it was clear that this had happened before. It wasn't a common occurrence, but it wasn't, it wasn't unheard of. And the general conjectures going around, you know, on the news were that it was either Satanists or they were aliens. And 
we we just thought this whole thing was very bizarre. And while we were actively engaged in discussing this in the, one of the hallways, one of the physics professors came down the hall. Now, now I don't recall who it was. It was my you know first or second week there, so I didn't know all of the professors yet. But he came down the hallway to find out what we were so excitedly discussing and and when he heard he said oh yeah yeah this happens from time to time it's very strange and no one ever figures out what happened and sometimes there's ufos sighted you know in the evening when you know when one of these mutilations happens but not always and so it's very bizarre and then he said but what's even stranger he said he said i have some colleagues up in the air force um, who work up at Malmstrom Air Force Base, and they they have problems there with UFOs flying over their their nuclear weapon sites, over the ICBM sites, and shutting down their missiles. And you know, we politely listened to his story, and and when he walked away, I we we laughed so hard, like, like and this was this became kind of a joke, you know. Oh yeah, and there's UFOs that shut down our nuclear missiles up at it you know, up at Malmstrom Air Force Base. And this was back in 1988, about 30 years ago now. And so, you know, I always remembered that event as being something quite humorous. And a couple of years ago, I was um, preparing lectures for an astronomy class, and I was talking about astrobiology and the possibilities for life elsewhere. And, and we had talked a bit about interstellar travel and I thought, well, I probably should discuss, you know, the what if, you know, what if aliens could come visit here? And so I was looking into this a little bit just to collect some information for a lecture. And I stumbled across one of the YouTube videos of the press conference that Robert Hastings had held, um, where he had five or six former Air Force personnel discussing UFO incursions on nuclear weapon sites. And I was and I was dumbfounded. Two, I think two of these guys were at Malmstrom Air Force Base. And I remember watching this thinking, this can't possibly be real. And and I thought, well, how how could it be that you've got these old timers coming out 25 years after I've heard this story, talking about events that happened in 1960s? Whereas back in 1988, I heard about this as an ongoing problem. And I thought, is it really possible that such a crazy rumor could just persist at an Air Force base, and I I really just felt that was unlikely. I thought, there's really, there maybe there's something to this. This is really odd. And so it was this, this unexpected correlation that really, really captured my attention. And so then I, then I thought, well, maybe I should do my homework. And I started looking into this a little bit and found that, you know, there indeed was a history of um, UFO sightings that um, nuclear power plants and 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 nuclear armed air bases and this has gone on all over the world and I was really um, I was really stunned by that. Mm -hmm. Now, have, have you yourself ever witnessed anything anomalous in the sky? <laughs> I, I expected this question was going to come. The answer is yes. I wish it was a really fantastic sighting. It wasn't. In some sense, it was interesting. I was I had been a computer programmer during my junior and senior years at um, Mercury Marine in, in Wisconsin. And I was coming out of work. Um, and I lived, I grew up in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, just south of Oshkosh, where they have the EAA, which is the Experimental Aircraft Association. So we were always very, very familiar with uh, fighter jets flying over and, and old World War II airplanes flying over our hometown in, in late summer every year. So this was this was about June. It was about a month or two early, and and I was walking to my car and I saw a fighter jet off in the distance. And I thought, what is what is a fighter jet doing here? We've got another month or month and a half before the EA. So I ran to my car, and I'm I'm also a bird watcher. I've been bird watching with my father since since I was about five years old. So I always kept a pair of binoculars in my car. So I ran to my car and grabbed a pair of binoculars and I and I looked and it was in, you know, and I realized, oh, there's two of them. There were two F-16s. And they basically were approaching from the north and they split up. And 
and I followed one of them, and he kind of came back around, and to my surprise, he came back around and passed the other one, and they both circled around. And so I kind of scanned the area to see what they were doing, and I realized that they were circling a, a metallic sphere. So this metallic sphere was about a third of the, the diameter of the sphere was about a third of the length of the, the F-16. And I've got a very clear view through the binoculars. There were no clouds in the sky. And um, the and I was watching for a while, and I thought, my God, it's like they're practicing a dogfight with this weather balloon. And I, I just assumed it was a weather balloon at the time. And, um, and sometime during this, I noticed that two more, I watched for a couple of minutes, two more F-16s came in from the west. And... I watched these four F-16s just buzzing around this metallic weather balloon for, I watched them for about three minutes. And and this is where I made my mistake. I thought, oh, you know, my brother's got to see this. Now, this is before cell phones. I couldn't just call home. So this required getting into the car and quick driving home, which was about, oh, maybe a 10-minute drive, drive. So I raced home and grabbed my brother, dragged him outside, and by the time we could get to where we had a good vantage point to the same patch of sky, they, the F-16s were gone, the weather balloon was gone, and you could only see the vapor trails. So he could, you know, he knew that I, you know, had had watched something. You could still see the the rat's nest of vapor trails up there. Hmm. But you know, and I for years I just thought that well, they were F-16s buzzing around a weather balloon in some kind of, you know, some kind of exercise. And I, and I remember sometime later I was talking to a friend of mine who was in the Air Force, and I told them that story, and 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 they said, well, that doesn't. They were in the Air Force in Wisconsin, and I, they said that doesn't make any sense. He said, first, you you wouldn't fly an F-16 anywhere near a weather balloon because you'd suck that thing into the air intake, you'd bring the plane down. And I thought, well, that's probably true. That that is kind of strange. And um. And then this person said, you know, they were thought it curious that there were two F-16s came from the north and and two from the west. And 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 my friend said, that sounds like the response to an urgent threat. Usually what you do is you send two F-16s from two different Air Force bases um, to address the threat. And and I said, really? I mean, you don't think it was some kind of exercise? And no, we don't perform exercises over populated areas, you don't do things like that. So then I thought, well, that's interesting. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know what that metal sphere was. You know, I wish, I wish I could say I knew more, but you know, it, it was a metallic sphere about 30, 40 feet long or in diameter. Hmm. Well, that, that, that is a good, that's a good, I, mo- most of my witnesses never use binoculars. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I was lucky to have them in the car, you know, yeah. And and I you know had a very good view and um, I measured the angular size with my thumb so you know I have some idea of about how big it was they were probably you know, given the angle they were probably I figured they were probably about five thousand feet up and um, you know I've, and and I was have been reading about other other witnesses and things recently and and how most people don't report their sightings I I've never I never reported it. Mm-hmm. So maybe it's time I should. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it wouldn't hurt. Um, too late to investigate it, but uh, yeah. Well, it was too late the ten minutes after I raced home too. <laughs> well, at least you could file a FOIA request or something, you know. To you oh, know, that's true. What were you chasing? But it's too late now. I think they uh, probably don't have those records, even or they would at least not admit to having those records. Oh, yeah. But because uh, this was what this is like uh, late seventies. No, oh, it would have been. It would have been uh, nineteen, I think, nineteen eighty-seven, probably June of eighty-seven. Okay. I mean, a lot of people read your article, and I don't think we need to necessarily rehash everything in the article, unless there's some point you want to expand on. No, I on. think I said it as best and carefully as I could in the article, and I'd rather the article speak for itself. Yeah, and we'll have a link in the show notes, so anybody wants to read it. it's not that long. Uh, well, thank you. Anybody wants to read it can can read it. What one thing that a lot of people think is a very urgent question is, and I'll, I'll read exactly what. He said, or she, I don't know. What can be done 
to lift the veil of ridicule regarding UFOs in academia? That's an excellent question. I think the answer is related to lifting the veil of ignorance. And, and that's always, it comes down to education. People need to be educated. Um, a few years ago, I gave a, a talk on UFOs um, just to our physics department. And, and it was very well received. I was very pleased to see how well received it was. You know, and several of the professors were, wow, I wasn't, real, I wasn't aware of all of these correlations and these interesting, you know, these interesting cases. And this sounds like so this is really fascinating. And so I had many people um, really react positively to that. So I think, you know, um, I think Stanton Friedman, you know, in some of his past lectures had said, you know, the first job of a scientist before they open their mouth and say something professionally is to do their homework. And I think that's what really needs to be done. Can you give us uh, an example of some of the correlations you thought were the most compelling? I think the the relation between UFOs and nuclear weapon sites and nuclear storage areas, I think that's really that's really fascinating. Um, it's also clearly important and um, it's it's important from a national security standpoint and um, and it could lead to an international incident if one of these craft gets mistaken for being Russian or Chinese or American. Um, and this is a big problem. There was an article a few years ago in Forbes magazine on how the Iranians have been having problems with with um, with spheres hanging around their their you know, nuclear power plants, and um, they call them CIA drones. You know, and so what are the capabilities of these spheres? Well, they can reach speeds to Mach 10. They can leave the atmosphere. They had a whole list of cap capabilities. Well, you know, that doesn't sound like any drone that I would know of, but um, but if the Iranians are thinking that these are CIA drones, you know, and let's say now there's an accident related to this. Well, in fact, there was. They had lost an F-15 pilot, you know, who was taking off to chase one of these things. You know, so now if they had blamed the United States for this, then we've got an international incident on our hands. So it would be very beneficial to know what these things are. Right. And... The, so I think that's so. So there's some impor obvious importance there, and mm -hmm. um, and so that that's helpful, I think, in getting people's attention. Do you, Do you think that <clears throat> the the veil of ridic ridicule would lift quickly if there were just enough factual information? Oof, that's a tough one. I I I'm not sure. I mean, we have flat earthers, and it's 2018. <laughs> True. I I don't know how. I don't. I don't. You're not going to lift everything with enough information. True. Um, but you don't have, I don't think you have to lift it that much. Okay. Uh, here's another question that I also have. Uh, and I've been asking a lot of people this. And, and how, uh, I'll, it's one of three questions this person asked, but I'll, uh, I, th I think the third one is the best one. How can we better approach experiential slash anecdotal? experiences scientifically? That's a very difficult question, especially for me as a physicist to handle, because we don't deal with anecdotal data. Um, a social scientist would, or a, or a psychologist would, but, but not a physicist. I guess we the general opinion probably among physicists would probably be that that isn't data. <laughs> that's not that's you know. But yeah, and I, I, I we hear that quite a bit. Yes. So I think that that's very difficult. Um, one of the things that might be helpful, what what captured you know what captured my attention more often is the is realizing that there are correlations that are surprising. And so, so I already mentioned one, this relationship, you know, UFOs being often seen around nuclear weapon sites. That's, that's a surprising correlation. That's something you don't expect. Um, and the, the fact that the Russian Navy 
when they released a lot of their information a few years ago, two thirds of the UFO sightings were related to water. UFOs coming in and uh, into coming, going into water or coming out of water. That was also something that I really didn't expect, and um, and it really, and when you see a correlation like that, it makes it hard to imagine how so many people are going to make that up or or you know imagine it or get it wrong that way. So so it lends some kind of credence to those to those accounts. Right. So I think I think one thing that would be helpful would be to um to use anecdotal data to compile statistics. And um and I think your I, I actually earlier listened to your conversation with Chris Cogswell. Mm-hmm. And he talked about he talked about compiling statistics, and and I think that that's a very important thing to do. I think that's exactly right. Yeah, we're, and we're trying to help him with that. Oh, yes. And so, getting statistics on shapes of crafts and type of craft and things like this would be would be very interesting. Right. So, uh, what do you think the most promising research directions are then? Well, I think I think compiling statistics is probably the the easiest thing that can be done the most straightforward thing that can be done with and it can be done with with the data that's you know currently held or the uh, accounts that have been collected so far um that would be a good a great first step i think there's a few other things that could be done the the if if now if you do have a situation where these craft these hypothetical craft are hanging around you know Missile missile sites or air force bases or wherever there's um, military activity, then well, those areas are kind of off limits to civilians, so that's going to be very difficult. You, you're then left with having to catch one of these things flying over a city or you know or somewhere else, and that's now you're left to just you know down to the statistics on how often this happens, which is probably not very often. So. It's going to be diff- very difficult to have equipment ready, ready to see one of these things. It's not like not like a tornado chaser where you get some heads up that you know a tornado right. might be coming. Um, so I think setting up. Um, there was some conversation that we had in the comment section of my article, and and you know, and this this came up there, and I think setting up um, observing sites basically where you you have cameras that watch the sky and that's that's one thing you could do and you could use this to do to do science in other ways too you could monitor meteorites incoming meteorites and things like this while you're while you're looking for ufos so that would be interesting right that's one possibility there are some very wide angle sky cams out there they but almost anything that passes through their field of view looks like a dot uh, yeah well that's and that's going to be the difficulty you're going to have to what you really have to do then is you're going to have to study the trajectories and and then pick out things that have interesting trajectories that aren't aren't typical of incoming meteors. So, so that's probably going to take you know to go through data like that. You can't really do that by hand. You're going to need some machine learning algorithms to basically monitor data coming from these sky cams, and that should be possible. Mm-hmm. Um, another possibility is to get satellite data. Now, if it's really true that you have some correlation between between these unidentified structured craft and um and water then you watch the watch earth's oceans and you can watch them with satellites and now now some of these some of these observed craft aren't that small you know we're going we're talking about sizes from 30 feet across which are going to be difficult to see in in identifying satellite imagery but you know some of these things have been reported to be 300 feet across or so that should be pretty easy to see with satellite data. So, hmm. so collecting satellite data and monitoring this again with machine learning algorithms would be another way to go. Yeah, well, there are, there are uh, satellite networks going up now that have much faster revisit times than the older ones. So there is some right. hope for that, that you could get a better surveillance. So, yeah, that that's promising. Uh, but again, you'd have to have the right software to look for that stuff. That's right. Well, maybe, maybe you know, I don't know if MUFON has, you know, relationships with where they could 
make some relationship with Google and get Google interested in this. That would be interesting. You know, maybe you can do something like that or. Yeah. Uh, there's, other, there's other possibilities. Yeah, because I, I know that uh, I work in the satellite area, so I know that a lot of stuff that just gets uh, thrown out as noise or, or, you know, it's simply, there must be some kind of artifact in the data because it's not real. It's, and then uh, there's no, nobody goes back and looks at it a second time. Oh, right, right. But there's just too many, there's too many, you know, terabits of stuff to look at. So Yeah, that's exactly it, yep. So, yeah, that's why you really need a machine machine learning algorithms to do it. You just don't have capability. You, you, people don't have the, aren't capable to go through that kind of data. Okay. Yeah. So um, now you're you're uh, you work in information science as well as in physics. I understand. Mm -hmm. So uh, is this the sort of thing that you might be interested in getting involved in yourself, or that's oh, possible? Yeah, that's something I've considered. Um, and you know, right now I'm busy with other projects, but it's something I've kept in mind, and and maybe at some point, you know, I'll I'll jump off and take on a, a project to see what can be done. That would be interesting. Right now, the uh, what would you say to say a young graduate student who came to you and said, uh, you know, I think maybe I could I could do some interesting information science with with uh, satellite data looking for UFOs. And that, would, would you encourage that, discourage that? Uh, when you're working with a student, your first job is to, you know, you're taking them on as a mentor and right. you really have to look out for their career. Uh -huh. And unfortunately, you, it, that probably at this point in time would be a career killer. I see, so. I really, I, re I, I would be of that opinion and I'm sure you know, a lot of my colleagues would think that that would be a career killer for for a graduate student. For I'm a tenured professor, you know, so I don't have those same concerns anymore. But you know, and I've also you know published you know over a hundred papers, so I'm not you know I've I've I have a reputation, so I can I can you know use that to stand on. But for a graduate student, it's it's a very difficult. It's a very different story. Right. Well, you know, uh, I guess it was probably a few decades ago. It was a bit of an embarrassment to be interested in SETI or or astrobiology, and it, it no longer is, right? So oh, that's right, yeah. So maybe I mean the, the current generation of scientists are, uh, even though they have no hard proof of life on other planets, they're very enthusiastic and and quite willing to identify as astrobiologists. So right, right. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. The 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 situations changed dramatically since when I was young. Since I was young, the and and again, I think some of it comes down to education. If you go back to how flying saucers and UFOs were perceived in the 1940s and 1950s, it was really thought as ridiculous. Which is one reason why this veil of ridiculousness has been able to propagate for so long. But you know, and let's say, let's just pick the year where you had the Roswell incident, right? So you've got 1947, you know, and there's a purported UFO crash. Well, 1947 is 10 years before 1957 when you had Sputnik, the first satellite. So, so you're 10 years before we've even launched anything into orbit. And to a lot of scientists and engineers in 1947, it was not clear that that was even possible. In fact, I think the British Royal Astronomer said two weeks before Sputnik that space travel is bunk. So, <laughs> so you, you, you have this attitude that you know space travel is probably not possible, and you know we've gone from that that state, you know, to you know launching satellites into orbit, putting people on the moon, and you know, literally exploring our solar system with robotic craft. And so, you know, and that's all happened in my lifetime, or the, the latter bits happened in my lifetime. I was born about two months before the Mariner, for, Mariner flyby of Mars. That's the first flyby of another planet. And, and now just three years ago, um, we had the flyby of Pluto. So we basically have, within 50 years, almost exactly 50 years, you know, completed the initial exploration of our solar system. So we've gone from not 
knowing whether space travel is possible or not to actually doing it. Um, we're still not very good at it. It's only been 50 years, um, but, but we do it and, and we have plans to do more. And then also in that period of time, we now know a lot more about, um, about the rest of the universe. Uh, you know, we didn't know whether there were planets orbiting other stars until you know the 1990s, and now we know of you know we have something like 5,000 exoplanet candidates at this point. Right. So we have some idea of what planets are like around other stars now. So that that bit of knowledge has changed. Um, we have better knowledge of biology at this point. We know about more about extreme life on earth so we know what conditions life can you know under which life can survive um we know that there's bacteria that can survive in vacuum we know you know we know a lot more about life as well and so i think you know with this with this education the the you know we realize that these ideas aren't aren't as silly as we once thought they were right and and so Maybe the uh, there's a sort of gradual trend towards, you know, there are some things that are always going to be silly, right? But <laughs> like yeah, like yeah. flat Earth will always be silly, but uh, <laughs> but well, there, there are... it's 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 it, that that especially is silly when there's so much evidence. I was yeah I was in South Africa teaching a summer course in January, and you look up and the moon's upside down. I mean, it literally is upside down. It's but that's because the Earth is round on him on the other side of it. Right. It's very, it's obvious. Anyone who's who's left, you know, left their county <laughs> and traveled, you know, it's obvious that the Earth is round. You, you know, we see this with, you know, with jet lag. You see it with, you know, just looking at the moon. And but, and and that's especially silly to me because. Eratosthenes knew that the world was round. He measured the size of the Earth. You know, back what was it around 300 BC or something yeah. like this? You know, so it's been the Romans knew the Earth is round. I, I collect Roman coins, and I actually have some coins here with you know of emperors holding up a globe. You know, and oh. the Romans knew the Earth was round, but now we have people in our advanced society doubting that. It's, it's that that to me is crazy. But well, right. But, but I mean, well, I guess more to the point. Uh, well, there there is a there's sort of a there's a reasonable ridicule and an irrational ridicule, and we, the irrational ridicule seems to be slowly stripping away. Right. Uh, I mean, it, I remember reading about uh, when special relativity first became, pub, it was published in the early 20th century. A, mm -hmm. lo a lot of physicists ridiculed it right away. Yep. Uh, a few recognized its importance, uh, and it took, a, you know, it didn't take that long. It took a few years before. It was becoming widely accepted, but uh, it was still there was there was that immediate response of what? No, <laughs> that can't yeah, be right. <laughs> that's right. And Albert Einstein was the victim of ad hominem attacks for several years because of that. It was not it was not easy. Yeah. Well, that and him being Jewish, I did, didn't well, help that either. Didn't, yeah, yeah, that didn't help either. Yeah. But uh, but what I would like to uh, I guess there's a couple more questions I'd like to get to from from people and. Uh, on Reddit, uh, and and then uh, so l let me just get to those. I, I I'm going to skip over some of them, and I uh, but um, here's one that I thought is is a good question. A question that I have. Uh, I don't know if if you've thought about it much, but let's go for it. Uh, the question is, um, uh, it basically he breaks it, or he or she breaks it into two questions. There's really one. It's uh, most videos, pictures, and sources uh, and and such are very unclear. Uh, why is this even with modern cameras? Uh, did you do you have some insight in, into why we don't have better videos and pictures of UFOs? Well, yeah, that's a difficult question. I think first, cell phone cameras aren't that great, <laughs> especially if you're that photographing, a, especially if you're photographing a distant object. I I'm like I said, I'm a bird watcher, and so you know, I I have you know, my camera with a 400 millimeter lens, but I usually also have my cell phone. And if I, if I'm traveling in a foreign country where I'm not familiar with the birds, I often try to get photos of them so I can identify them later. And, and, 
and sometimes I'm caught unawares and I just have my cell phone and I, you know, try to get a picture with my cell phone. And then what do you do? You blow it up and you look at this blurry picture of a bird and try to, you know, and take several photographs and hope that you can, can figure out what it is, at least narrow it down. And so, so that's, you know, that's the reality of the situation. Most people's cameras aren't that good. Um, now there's, um, uh, there there are some times when people do have good cameras and they can get get good photos. So there was a case I know um, Richard Haynes who ran the NICAP website. He had an article on um, some amateur astronomers were um, on the hills just south of Palo Alto and witnessed a a um, a bright white orb following a jet airplane that had just taken off from, I don't know if it was from San SFO or I don't remember exactly what the situation, what the jet was doing, but they actually got photographs of this and, and you know, they're clear photographs of the jet. Now there's no structure on this white light, but the white light moves around from frame to frame and it's very interesting. You know, so there are people with good cameras who can sometimes get lucky and get shots, but I, I had somebody, one of my students asked me a question like this uh, about a year ago or so, and I said, we, you know, I live in Albany, so we have, an, we, have an air, we have a pretty large airport here, and it's not too difficult to see airplanes, especially when you're on campus. So I said, well, here, let's do an experiment. Um, in the next 24 hours, each of us is to get a photograph with our cell phone of a jet airplane that's flying over. Aha. Uh -huh. How how good are these photographs going to turn out to be? And and I and well, I, I had the best one, but it really was a pretty crappy photograph of a jet airplane. Interesting. So, but I think you know anybody who wonders about this, you know, do the experiment yourself and convince yourself. See how easy it is to get a picture of a jet airplane. You know, that that that's excellent because I that, I've been doing experiments like that myself. Uh, I I have uh you know action cameras, uh like. You know, wide angle, wide angle action cameras. I have my cell phone. I have a pretty decent Sony mirrorless camera, and I have and I have uh, some of these nice little point and shoot cameras, like the Olympus. I have the Olympus Tough, and <laughs> and you know. So the question, every time I see a plane go over, I try to get a shot with at least one of them, and yeah. I I get some really crappy shots. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's what happens. It's I mean, first it's the planes moving. You're you're usually doing something else when you see it, so you have to trust. I, I had a C five fly by yesterday because wow. I I work near it, not far from Andrews Air Force Base, and uh, a C five was flying right at me, and I fumbled around to get my camera out, <laughs> got it out, I got one very distant picture. You can see it's a C five, but it it's a huge airplane, you know, if it, and it doesn't move that fast, but you know, I, I managed to uh, only get one good shot. And it was Can coming right at me. Pardon? Do you see any markings on it? I couldn't. No, I couldn't. Uh, well, no. part, part of the problem was the sky <laughs> was so right. bright that it that it it's badly underexposed. Yeah. Uh, and even pumping up the contrast, you don't see anything. So. It's it's difficult to do, even with, you know, yeah. There's a lot of cameras around, but there are not a lot of photographers, <laughs> and so most most people are not very good at taking pictures and. And these cameras are not that great for the most part. So it's that's really the re the answer, I think. I just have one more question, um, and it's pretty much the question uh, everybody wants your opinion on. I, I'm not sure you've really looked into it, and I'll I'll accept that as an answer. But uh, uh, a lot of people want to know what you think about the uh, last December's AA tip revelations and the and the videos that came out that were per that are ostensibly Navy videos showing. The Tic Tac UFO and the and the uh, there's another there's a couple others that are that came out uh, mm -hmm. from a later incident, but there's a 2004 Nimitz incident, which does seem to be a real thing, although we haven't got great documentation yet. But I just wondered if if you thought that was good evidence or of something or what it's what it's evidence of. Well, I, I again I'd like to know more. This is the problem with with this with this phenomenon being studied covertly. Or you know, or having this information classified, you don't have access to all of the information. You you don't have any control over the methods used to study it in order to collect the data, and um, so the data you get is just what they happen to hand you, which is 
not always that useful, and that's a that's a bit of a problem. You know, the 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 imagery is compelling and interesting. The um, and I think even more compelling is the 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 information that you have, the reports from the radar operators and the pilots, and in in conjunction with the with the imagery, I think you you need to take it all together in one piece. You know, when you when you are formulating hypotheses on data, you have to use all of the data. So, you know, some of the people who had looked at this said, "Well, you can't really see anything from the images, so I don't know what it is. I don't know what to make of this." Well, you know, you can do better than that. And I think that you have to look at the whole, the whole story, and 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 I think together the the story is very compelling. Okay. The um, I would like to know more. It would yeah. be great to get some of the radar data from these things. The, you know, if you've got these these things appearing at eighty thousand feet and dropping down to the sea surface in just a few seconds, you're talking about very high accelerations. Yes. You know, you know, well over a hundred g acceleration. So, you know, in some cases, I've been able to, you know, from the testimony or the reports, you can estimate some of these accelerations, and and anything over twenty five g is going to kill a person. So, these very high accelerations are really interesting. And um, and and then the question that a scientist needs to ask, that no one ever seems to ask, which always surprises me a little. The, the whole idea isn't to the whole idea isn't to debunk one hypothesis. The whole idea is to consider a whole bunch of hypotheses and compare them to each other. So, is it more probable that you know this that this is the case as compared to that or whatever? And that's what you'd really need to do when you're analyzing these situations. But but in order to do that, you have to have some expectation. You have to of what what <laughs> these have to be. Um, Hypotheses that make predictions. So, so I always ask myself, what what would I expect to see if I was observing, you know, some a spacecraft? What kind of capabilities would you expect to see? Well, I'd expect to see unreasonably high accelerations. You know, that would be. Is that so? Then you ask, is is the fact that you've observed, you know, something accelerating at over 100 g consistent with? The hypothesis that it's an interstellar spacecraft. Well, that's the that's the real question you want to ask, and so you can then do the math, and you can very easily show that if you're going to let's let's say that this craft can maintain a hundred g acceleration for some period of time, and let's say it accelerates halfway through the trip and then decelerates at that same acceleration the other half. Um, and if you you do the math, you find that by accelerating at 100 g, you could travel um, 40 light years in 55 days ship time. So this mm -hmm. is what happens is relativity. Right. You know, the, a lot of people say, well, they can't. You can't travel faster than light, so you can't travel between the stars. Well, no, that's science fiction. You know, the the fact is relativity works with you. you know, the faster you go. You know your your clock slows down, and so you can travel much greater distances in shorter periods of time. So, so I've so I've actually done the math for 100 g because that's um, that was one of the cases that I was looking at. So if you accelerate at 100 g and then decelerate, you know the other half of the trip, you could literally traverse the galaxy in 120 days. That's a that's a four month journey, which is about how long it takes us to get to Mars now. So, so you know, with a 100 g acceleration, you could go from one side of the galaxy to the other in the same amount of time that it takes us to get to Mars. It not only not only is a craft like that, which is observed, consistent with the hypothesis that it's a spacecraft, but it's not only just a spacecraft. It's an exceptionally respectable spacecraft. You know, if you can get across the galaxy in 40, 40 days, or if, I'm sorry, four months, 120 days, that's that would be fantastic. Hmm. Yes. And opens up a lot of possibilities. Exactly. Yeah, it, it really does. Now, one of the things that really fascinates me about that, that idea is that 
And this is why science fiction resorts to faster than light travel is because while to the occupants of the ship, they would see traveling across, they would, they would be able to travel across the galaxy in 100 days. Um, for the rest of the galaxy, watching them, it would take 150,000 years. And so now if they decided to come back to Earth and visit Earth again, after going from one side of the galaxy to the other, they're going to make, they could make it back in eight months. They could, you know, do a round trip in eight months. Um, meanwhile, 300,000 years would pass Earth time. So the problem is you can't come home. And that's really the problem with interstellar travel as I see it, aside from all the engineering problems. But there's nothing, that, I guess my main point is there's nothing in the physics that prevents you from traveling to the stars. It's the, you know, the relative, once you get going fast, the relativity works with you. Problem really is with the engineering. We don't, we don't have a, we don't have propulsion systems that can continually accelerate. We run out of fuel. And that's, that's the main problem. And then even if you could get going close to the speed of light, like some a craft like this would, then, um, then you have the fact that you're going to be, that space is not empty. You've got about one atom of hydrogen per cubic meter, and you're going to be plowing into this at about, you know, at 90 some percent the speed of light. And that hydrogen gas in the galaxy will tear your ship to shreds in no time. So, so there's some huge engineering problems here as well, but the physics doesn't stop it from happening. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize. So, yeah, I, I, I like that idea about multiple hypotheses. We need to keep that in our, in our minds, I think. Right. Because we tend to, we tend to uh, get tunnel, pretty much tunnel vision, depending on whether we're trying to debunk or, or uh, support a hypothesis. Well, yeah, I, and I think this, and I think this idea of traveling, you know, if, you know, if you, if we were, to, if we were to become interstellar travelers, you know, we would have to deal with this fact that you won't be able to come home. Um, and there's a simple answer to that: is the answer is you become nomadic. You live in tribes and family groups, and you travel all the time, and you meet up. So you literally become explorers, and and you form. You know, Richard Dolan, I think, talks about breakaway societies, but this would literally be a breakaway society where you just become your own society and you become a society of nomadic travelers through space time. Hmm. Which is, you know, I, there's, you know, if you can find friends to do that with you. I think that might be a very romantic idea. <laughs> you can watch, you know, you're racing through time, you know, forward in time as you're traveling. So you actually get to watch the galaxy evolve over time, which would be a pretty fascinating thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to expand on or before we wrap up? Oh, no, I think, I think the, the, the other, um, I think the last thing I'd like to say is, you know, even, even to people who don't think that we've been visited yet, you know, the, you do have to ask the question, um, what would happen if we were? What do you expect would happen if we were? You know, and you would expect that, you know, perhaps some craft would arrive and maybe fly over the Amazon rainforest or over a populated area like Houston and, you know, take some data, collecting data. A few people are going to see it and those people are going to report something strange and what's going to happen? Nobody's going to believe them. And so, so the, I really think that you know, changing our mindset is important because if we are ever interested in catching something like this happening, you know, then then um, then we would have to then we have to change our mindset and be ready for it, which is which is important, I think. Okay, I think we'll wrap it up there. Thanks a lot, Kevin Knuth. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks a lot. All right. Good night. Good night. Once again, I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Kevin Knuth, and also everybody online who submitted questions. Again, this has been conversation number 11 of API Conversations. For more information about this conversation, others, and our regular episodes, 
please go to www.apicasefiles.com or you can visit our regular site. Go to reportaufo.org. Reportaufo.org is also the URL you want to use to submit a sighting report. We have a lot of information there about our cases, our methods, who we are, how we do it, and also the podcast and our video series on YouTube. So any more questions you have, the best thing to do is to contact us through the website. Again, that's reportaufo.org. You can also follow us on Twitter at API Case Files. API Case Files, conversation number 11 with Kevin Knuth. This has been Paul Carr, and we'll see you next time.